Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Forty Orty podcast. It's very sunny, and I am very happy that it's sunny because when it's all gloomy and dark, it's it's very depressing. And with all the isolation stuff that's going on, um, as um as we're recording this, it it can be a little bit sort of dark and gloomy anyway. But it's nice to have a little bit of sunshine, and today. We're going to be talking about autism and gender stereotypes, which is something that I've been wanting to talk about for a while now. And basically, I got in contact with the National Autistic Society um, following the release of my documentary. And we sort of did a little bit of a video interview, a little bit of a blog post about the documentary and sort of my time filming it. Um, during isolation and I was introduced to the very lovely Hermione Cameron from the National Autistic Society. How are you doing Hermione? I'm doing okay thanks Thomas, how are you doing? I'm all right, I'm pretty good. I've been recently um, sorting out my new room that I'm moving into so I spent yesterday just scraping glue off the the floors of... (laughs) Because there used to be a carpet and stuff and we we never really got, um, it's now a wooden floor and we had sort of like, I I was basically on my hands and knees scraping it off with a butter knife for a long time last night. So my hands are very sore and my my girlfriend's hands are a little bit stingy from all the chemicals that we were using. Oh gosh. We probably should have used some gloves or something. That sounds productive. Yeah, it is. Um, I'm just happy that that we're getting to it now. So yeah, yeah, we uh, we met on that sort of video interview that we did, and we had a little bit of a blog post that we did. Was yeah, stories from the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess I just just sort of wanted to, because obviously I, I don't really have much of an opportunity to talk to people from the National Autistic Society and considering it's, um, I think, quite widely regarded as a good sort of nice and and safe space for autistic people. It's it's nice to be able to chat from somebody who is quite a a key um, worker in terms of the social media side. What what is your job title? Are you like the the content producer? Um, So my job title title is content officer brackets copy um so we so i kind of um i guess it's mostly editing really a lot of editing and copywriting and assisting the um senior editor with things like so i've yeah i've kind of taken on the um stories from the spectrum role which is what we interviewed you for which is our kind of series of interviews and blogs like that are sort of where we chat to autistic people and kind of get a sense of their day-to-day lives and like maybe we'll talk about something they've done like a cool project like with your documentary or um and yeah just kind of get trying to get an in-depth perspective from autistic people and their families and I also um so I don't know if you've read the Spectrum magazine. I have seen it, yeah. Mm, it was called Asperger United, and um, it's edited by yeah a guy um, on the content team called The Goth, who's a very nice man, who's on the Spectrum himself, um, and he's been um, editing it for quite a while now. And our team were kind of, about a year ago or so, we kind of... Um, sort of took on uploading it online and kind of 
so I kind of handle the sort of online version of it and I sometimes I try and do fun things like I recently put together an archive of articles and artwork and poems wow. from previous editions which like relating to the theme of home and I try and do it like we had one before on um, aliens which is quite fun one before <laughs> on animals and aliens <laughs> so, yeah there is some yeah well someone wrote an article about uh, this theory that um people on the autistic spectrum might have like alien <laughs> dna yeah, yeah. um which is actually very interesting is it quite in depth um yeah it was quite in depth and i think we just thought oh that's a very interesting theme and it's often obviously it's not a metaphor that a lot of autistic people will like or relate to but it's often a lot of people talk about this feeling that they're sort of from like they're on the wrong planet kind of thing kind of theme so we sort of went for that and kind of collected a lot of a lot of people like talked about doctor who and how they related ah. a lot to the doctor yeah um so yeah doing i mean doing things like that i guess that's that's kind of the part of my job that i like the most and because i mean i'm a writer myself so i mainly do poetry so yeah i just enjoy reading other people's work and wow how did yeah, you... I also work on like kind of. Sorry, carry on. Um, <laughs> how did you get? How did you get involved with the 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 National Autistic Society? Like, what was the um the process like of getting on the team? Um. Well, I actually started there as a volunteer, and at the time, I was doing a bit of sort of freelance work outside for a different place, and but I'd always kind of wanted to work for a cause that you know I really cared about or I always wanted to work for a charity uh, so I was volunteering there for a while and then um yeah eventually they took me on um because I just kind of kept coming back <laughs> <laughs> so they couldn't really get rid of me so I was kind of volunteering on and off and then started temporarily and then eventually it moved to a permanent position wow um, i definitely um i definitely em empathize with the the whole working for for a cause that you um feel quite deeply because i think one of one of the issues with um most people in their jobs is that i think most most people try and focus too much about like the money aspects or the like the reputation aspects and I was a little bit on that kind of side when I uh, went to uni because <clears throat> I, I did a course in, in biomedical sciences, which is, it's basically the main prerequisite for sort of uh, clinical research and, you know, of diseases and, and different sort of neuro, neuroscience related things. And I... I, I very much sort of idolised that since I was, um, before I started A-levels. And it's, now that I'm older, I, I sort of realised that, although it would be nice to do research and, and sort of add to the sort of archive of scientific um, discoveries, it's... It's nice just to to focus on something that is quite quite close to your heart. It gives you a lot of like motivation to get up and and continue working. Would you say that that's something that that you you relate to quite a lot? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm I'm extremely lucky, really, that I'm able to do that because I have done you know kind of previous work which isn't something that you know you might enjoy it but I, I think I'm very lucky to do something that I feel is so personal to me like to get yeah and to get paid for that is yeah I'm fortunate that it's not just a job like it really sort of means the world to me really because this wasn't you know it wasn't being on the autistic spectrum wasn't really even something that I 
like my close friends and family knew obviously but wasn't something that I spoke about openly until I started volunteering initially and then work at National Autistic Society and kind of thought well now that I work there I sort of got to talk about it I can't really not. <laughs> um, so yeah it's really sort of changed things for me what were you doing before um before you saw when you were doing like all that um, volunteering and stuff I did like I did various things um actually it's quite funny whilst I was doing the volunteering I was uh got through a friend who used to work for the um dating site Badoo and Bumble and I was doing ah. some online moderation for them which was interesting <laughs> <laughs> um but it was very yeah it was very like random really um, well, that sounds like a cool job anyway like it's not something that most people are involved with yeah again it wasn't something that I thought that I really would get into but you know I was lucky I guess I had a friend who worked for them so he could kind of help me get involved with that and I also well because my degree was um English with creative writing so I kind of worked in bookshops and stuff uh, just like as a tent jealous that sort of thing yeah was, again I, I was sort of lucky to <laughs> be able to do that um but yeah I think at the same time having a sort of creative arts degree or like a sort of humanities degree is not as useful <laughs> as doing something maybe more practical but again I was very lucky that I was able to study what I what I love really yeah and I suppose having that um well I, th I think I think the difference between sort of like you know hum humanities and, and sort of like science science based or like practical degrees is that it's it's very sort of limited in the, it, it leads to a job like the um sort of practical side of things but it, it doesn't give you much of a a new angle on things whereas i think like degrees like humanity in the sort of humanities and and things such as your degree give you a little bit of a would you say like a like a personal sort of more um well-rounded view on things maybe a little bit of a different angle um i think so yeah it sort of gives you time to kind of think and reflect and yeah, I consider things from a different perspective, like my my undergraduate degree in particular, that was um which was at Falmouth University, which I loved. Um yeah, I sort of liked it because we didn't kind of study just like canon, you know, that sort of I guess typically as people would say, sort of dead white males yeah. <laughs> kind of literature. We sort of looked at a variety of writers from like around the world and you just see things from a perspective that you would never have considered before or that I for me that I you know I wouldn't have considered before because I wouldn't have been exposed to it yeah and and with your with your poetry like have you because I, I think I, I think I do remember you saying something about like competitions that you've entered and, and all that I had my, I had a collection published actually, um, by, was actually, um, yeah, a small company called Ampersand Publishing, and my house, I was very lucky actually, because my housemate decided to set up his own publishing company, and he managed to do it, which was like a massive achievement, and he, um, published my collection, which is called Recipe for Being a Woman, as well as a, um, short sci-fi sort of short fiction which is called um welcome to earth mm -hmm. um unfortunately they closed they had to close down but yeah it's still like a really something that i really enjoyed and was very proud of and yeah one of my poems in there um 
which is called Not Always Grey, was shortlisted for the Bridport Prize, which, yeah, I was very proud of. I think that's probably sort of my kind of proudest, one of the proudest moments of my life, I guess. Wow. I'm just, uh, I just had a little Google search of your um, recipe for being a woman. That look like, it looks really cool. Like, is it, is it? Oh, thank you. I've um I'm looking at this this website called Foul Writing. Is that? Oh right, yeah. There's a review on. I think that's um somebody from Falmouth University did a review. Of the book. Mm-hmm. Um and yeah, it was illustrated by um Louise Armishalou, who um was a children's illustrator, and she did these like really beautiful black and white like quite simple black and white illustrations which work really well so I was yeah I was very lucky with that um I know it was like it's really very exciting time I think when that when that came out definitely like um, and it being, was... a, being a published author and stuff that's that's like one of the things that I I definitely want to do in my life yeah you should yeah <laughs> There is a little sort of quote that, that's in there. It says, um, I, I'm assuming this is from you. Like many of the poems in the collection, it illustrates the commonness of mental illness and how debilitating it can be. Is mental illness quite a big um, player in the book? Like, do you talk about it a lot within the poems? It, yeah, I do, I think. There are a few... Like there are a few poems in there, I think, that I actually was a bit hesitant when I was kind of going through it with the publisher, and I was like, oh, I don't know if, you know, I should include that. Like, is that a bit dark, or is that... Um, but he was very, you know, insistent that I did include them, and I was very glad that I did. Um, but yeah, it does sort of talks about, um, yeah, grief, mental illness, kind of self-image, um, some elements of sort of self-harm and that, like there's one particular mm-hmm. poem in there which is called um, The Other Side, which is kind of about, I get yeah, I guess sort of suicidal ideation. Yeah. Having a moment when you, yeah. I'm very much, I very much like, like artistic sort of, um, things to do with you, you would you say that poetry is art I would say that poetry is like word art like it's definitely it's definitely a form of art in my mind <laughs> yeah in a sense yeah and there was um I did sort of try to play with that there's one poem that I did um which you'll see as in like the shape of a fingerprint uh, that I did yeah. and it, it's called yeah it's supposed to be it's called ID it's supposed to be yeah kind of around yeah, I suppose the literal theme of identity. But yeah, I think, yeah, I'd agree with you that because you have to be so, every word matters so much that it is sort of like painting with fine brushes. Yeah, I feel, I definitely think that any sort of like creative writing is um, a form of art. Because I, 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 I'm very much of the, the view that art is sort of a a more... Um, efficient way of translating emotions to other people, like, and I feel like um, writing and 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 poetry and, and creative writing is a a very good sort of avenue for blending blending the two together. So blending the emotion and the and the sort of um, experiences and the, and the communication together. So I find that like creative writing and poetry is is something that I'm particularly interested in. Like it's it's very cool. I will definitely have to have a read of this. Yeah, no, I mean I'm I'm happy to to give you a copy. If you want. Ooh, could you sign it for me as well? <laughs> I can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> An original. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. We haven't. Um, I haven't sort of uh, highlighted it in the, in the questions that I've put together, but 
is mental illness something that's that's quite a big part of your life like you don't have to answer if you if you don't feel comfortable um yeah yeah I, i'd say it is something that i definitely have always struggled with anxiety and depression and um you know particularly as as a teenager um i think i was had a really difficult year when i was 12 13 which i guess is like sort of peak puberty time which might be true <laughs> <laughs> um where i just sort of felt i don't know just like this sort of darkness and i didn't know what depression was at the time and i probably like behaved yeah i think i just behaved really horribly because I, d- I didn't know like what was going on and I just kind of well I just, mm-hmm. in the sense I just sort of isolated myself I think um, yeah and it's it's very difficult like I feel like uh being being on the spectrum and having mental and um, health difficulties can be like a because even, even like the combination between like the, there are these like uh, what they describe in psychology, vicious cycles. So anxiety has its own vicious cycle and depression has its own vicious cycle. Basically like cycles that you, you go through that keep you in the in the sort of mental head space of whatever condition that is. And I feel like that the combination of those two and autism just makes life just a mess, especially like in teenager. And I've definitely found that. Yeah, because I guess as well, when you're on the spectrum, it's kind of like, I mean, they use the word anxiety a lot, but I wasn't entirely sure what that meant. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's kind of like, oh, it's because you have an autism diagnosis that you're experiencing this. And it's almost like sort of mental health issues can get missed because of that. Like people yeah. don't kind of realise that you can have be more than one thing at once. No. Yeah, and I think that there is sort of a so with with the, the the documentary that I that I produced, it was it was basically trying to highlight sort of like the the mental the mental health issues in the autistic community, and I f- I feel like one of the reasons why these like statistics aren't really talked about is. Is that that most people would sort of assume that because you're autistic, your life isn't as good, if that makes sense. Yeah. Which I don't think is I don't think it's a, it's a good representation of what most autistic people feel or think. From my experience, like I know I know autistic people who don't have any mental health conditions and they're they're really happy just living their own life and and you know going about whatever they want to do and it only seems really to be a problem when there are those aspects of mental health included and I do I do I am of the the view that as much that talking about it as much as possible is is the the best way to get it get it seen by like the mainstream media and stuff like that because that's really what we need in order to have like a change and stuff yeah, definitely. I I like that you've you've included those those aspects in your in your book. I think that's a a great thing. And even even with things like you know like self harm and stuff, like I when when I was sort of in it, in my teenagehood, there's kind of like yourself, which is why I laughed. I I developed some quite severe uh, mental health difficulties. You know, like with the typical depression, anxiety, a couple of dissociative conditions. And uh, I I was I, I self harm self harm for about three or four years. Um so it's it's something that I don't think it's something that, that people would think of me looking at me now, but like it is it's it is something that, you know, happens and it happens more and like seems to happen more in the, the autistic community, I think. For me, I think when I, um, yeah, when I went through this, like, very sort of dark period, it, 
yeah, like I said, I just didn't really, because, I mean, people are talking about it more now, but I think at the time, it was something that people were aware of, but it wasn't something that was sort of talked about in the mainstream. And so mm -hmm. I just didn't really know what it was. I kind of felt like, I mean, quite fittingly, I'm like very, very big, like Harry Potter nerd, yeah. <laughs> I guess. And I kind of, <laughs> I kind of felt like, you know, the way that she describes, J.K. Rowling describes Dementors, how the sort of yeah. sucking, straight you feel as though all the you're happy you'll never be happy again and all the your positive mm -hmm. thoughts are drained from you and am i right in thinking that the the dementors are we're supposed to be like a a metaphor for depression so yeah. i think i've read, read that before yeah absolutely because i think at the time she was very depressed and was on like was completely broke and like was a single mother and yeah, and I, I just thought, yeah, that that was very sort of accurate representation of how it felt, and that's couldn't really describe it any. I mean, I remember saying to my mum that I felt as though I sort of fall spiraling into a black hole. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was just yeah, it's just very very strange. I think now that I know what it is, it's easier to deal with when it, if those feelings arise, which they do from time to yeah. time. I think um, one of the difficulties of being on the spectrum is, you know, something that's quite common is that um, alexithymia, which are, which is like the, um, it's it's sort of like the medical sort of scientific term for not being able to notice and understand your own emotions. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel I feel like that that that's one of the things that adds a a whole new dimension to the struggles in teenagehood and I suppose the struggles with like mental health and stuff. It's it's quite hard to deal with something when you're not sure when you're dealing with it and what causes it and mm. and all of that. It's very much like a investigative process to try and mm. get over these conditions. I think. Especially yeah. when you're artistic. It's that sort of like that kind of hollowness that you sort of feel. Yeah, it's it's I think think one of the misconceptions is that like depression feels the same as being sad. Because mm. I, I don't I don't think it is the same as being sad. It's it's very it's very novel, it's very separate from sadness, like typical sort of sadness, you know, you'll you'll feel that welling up behind your head you'll feel the need to sort of connect with other people whereas depression yeah. is sort of that dull hollow meaningless feeling in the back of your back of your head that sort of consumes anything like like a dark cloud that just is constant yeah. that, that only only you can see and it highlights all of the the negative things you know the negative things are more bright and positive things are a little bit more hidden and difficult yeah. to notice yeah and it's i do like, think it is different yeah it's all about that feeling that because when you're sad when you're sad i guess you you kind of know that it will pass in a way often and it feels quite cathartic it's like depression. yeah you like a release yeah it's like depression you kind of lose or from my experience i kind of lose all sort of sense of time and yeah i do feel that sort of you know, soul suck it like I'll never be happy again. Happy again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's taken a very lovely, lovely yeah. turn. This podcast. Sorry. Apologies for this. No, no, it's my. It's um, it's 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 good to talk to. Um, talk talk to talk about. So we so we talk a little bit about autism. Yeah, let's see that. <laughs> what's your ex what's your experience with it like when were you diagnosed and what sort of journey did you go on post diagnosis um well I was diagnosed when I was very young I think it was like just before my fifth birthday and um it was actually funny the thing that you said about when you mentioned that uh your mum took you to McDonald's like just after your diagnosis 
Um, actually, actually I, I recently like my mom my mom was chatting to me about it and apparently my dad was there as well so I've just been like telling people this story of my mom took me to McDonald's but my dad was actually there as well oh okay well, that's nice <laughs> that adds a new dimension to the story um but yeah I yeah I just have this I don't remember but I think my mom took me to London um my dad was on holiday at like um, I think it was at a wedding actually in South Africa but yeah anyway it was his brother's wedding. but that's irrelevant <laughs> yeah she took me to the assessment centre in London and I think I was assessed by um, Gillian Baird who was like quite a pioneer in autism um, and yeah the diagnosis was Asperger's syndrome at the time and Apparently, she said to my mum, like, oh, I can already tell that her main struggle is going to be anxiety. She was quite, um, quite a lot of foresight, I guess, for her, because she was right. Um, and, yeah, like I said, I don't, I remember being at McDonald's afterwards with my um, my mum, my grandfather and his wife at the time. Um, and... But I, I don't connect. I didn't connect that day to my assessment. I guess I was just so young. And then um, I think when I, yeah, when I was, I really struggled at school. Um, and I just, I think I came home one day and I said to my mum, I was like, I think there's something wrong with my personality, and that like really upset her. Um, and she gave me this book called. The Blue Bottle Mystery, which is a story about by Kathy Hoopman, I think it's the author. And it's about this boy called Ben who gets it's kind of a I think there yeah, there is like a sort of detective element to it as far as I remember, and he gets diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome and I read it and I was like, Oh my gosh, that sounds like me and I went and told my mum and she was like, Well my parents and they were like Yes, you're right, you know, and I felt really relieved. What kind of age were you were you when you were reading that? Um, eight, I think. But then I remember going to school the next day and like telling my best friend that I I had a problem with my brain. <laughs> um <laughs> and <laughs> she reacted in a way that was like really sweet. That's like, Oh, you know, it's okay, Hermione, like I've got a friend who's got a problem with her eye, like it you know, it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and yeah I think I don't know when I, I didn't really I think again especially when I was a teenager I was just I just felt very like embarrassed by it and I didn't really want to whenever I told a friend about it I would like always kind of tell them like oh I got this map you know even when I was at university and stuff I'd be like I've got this really big secret um and then they sort of like often cry when I told them and they um you know they, they'd be like it's fine but they usually wouldn't really know a lot about autism or what that meant um but they were always like accepting um yeah and I kind of just That's really great to hear. yeah I mean there were some people who were like you know kind of thought that I was sort of using it as an excuse which kind of annoyed me because I, f I tried so hard like not to use it as an excuse yeah it's like it's 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 very sort of ironic isn't it that it's it's actually something autistic people have a whole sort of name for hiding autism like masking and stuff like we try very hard not to um, mm. attribute it to autism as much as possible. Like it's it's a bit yeah. weird that people see it that way. Yeah, and I just remember. Yeah, I just like I think I just like just just did not want to be different, or I wanted to be like acceptably weird in a way. And I think that's often sort of how people saw me as being like, oh, but you're like quirky or whatever. I don't know, um, but uh, yeah, I always had a lot of like emotional problems. Like I would cry a lot, which is quite embarrassing. <laughs> um, 
and yeah then I, I kind of started telling more and more people the more I got older and then yeah it wasn't until I started volunteering and working at the NAS that I kind of came out so to speak as being on the spectrum and so that's it's it from from like the the story that you're telling me because it's it's not often I mean, unsurprisingly, it's not often that I I talk to, to someone who's um been diagnosed young as well. I mean, I was diagnosed when I was ten. Okay. But there, but there is sort of around around the sort of end of primary school, you do start to feel a little bit strange and weird, and like some of the things that the other kids say yeah. or how they act just don't really feel right, like. You don't understand that you sort of feel like they're they're weirdo. sort of the aliens. Yeah, they <laughs> you feel like a weirdo. Um and it's, especially for me, like um I was I was very into the the whole sort of romantic sort of side to to life. So I was I was, you know, like I would sort of go up to girls that I liked and, and sort of try to, you know, have <laughs> So yeah. connection, connection, connect with them. Yeah, have a Aww. connection with them, and obviously that that led led to a lot of embarrassment. I think one time I, I wanted to change schools because I sent like a a really heartfelt letter to one of them, and <laughs> I know it was tragic, but <laughs> it was okay. It was the it was near to the end of primary school, so it wasn't too bad. Yeah. But I definitely empathize with that that aspect of things. But I I never really, I never really looked into autism or or tried to understand autism until I sort of started re- reaching the end of high school. Mm. Like, it's it's kind of, I think I I didn't like autism at the time because I attributed all the mental health difficulties and the anxiety and depression to my autism yeah. at the time. Oh, that's interesting. Since I started to grow up and, and get a bit older, that I made the the distinction between the two. Mental health, I think uh, another aspect is that mental health definitely was the focal point of my life, uh, you know, since the age of about 13 to about 20, 21, 22, like a year ago. <laughs> so it's... it's um. It was sort of a little bit of a barrier for me, sort of learning about myself and all that. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I feel a lot of what sort of story that you're telling me, I feel definitely sort of reflects um, on my life um, quite a lot, the things that you're saying. I do, I do think at, at one point when I started doing the YouTubing and stuff, like, Nowadays, I, I'm very inclined to just tell people straight to the face that I'm autistic. Like, it's 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 not like I'll go up to someone and say, "Hi, my name's Tom. I've got autism." Yeah. <laughs> <But> it's, <laughs> yeah. It's 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 more like we'll have a chat about stuff, and then it'll come up in a way. So like, we'll be we'll be. It's it's usually when we're talking. For some reason people like to talk about politics when they go to like parties and stuff so it's um whenever he started talking about politics and and sort of uh um different different views on the world and stuff then then my autism becomes um something that i can mention to and it's it's never a thing that i feel ashamed of talking about anymore because yeah. i feel i'm very aware of how it makes me different and I'm also very sort of proud in in a in a weird way like it's it's nice to feel comfortable in your own skin yeah no I I found myself like talking about it at parties quite a lot and I often find that people have like a connection to it or work with autistic people or have a family member and um yeah it's mad isn't it Sometimes I get, you know, that slightly sort of well-meaning, but, you know, quite sort of unintentionally slightly offensive response. It's like, oh, but don't worry, I'd never know. And I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> like, um, And 
people I think are generally because my fear was always that people would be like you know thinking that you're a freak you're a weird you know all these things that you sort of felt as a child that I sort of felt as a child that you know sort of people would sort of see it like because there is still a lot of stigma around neurological conditions and mental health conditions that, that mm-hmm. um but I found people, you know, have either reacted like really amazingly or like kindly but slightly ignorantly. Yeah. And then yeah, you can I feel kind of, that. Yeah. I, and then you can kind of talk to them about it and then they learn something, which is always good. Mm-hmm. I'm usually quite, I'm quite an extroverted sort of social person when I know that I'm going to an event that's social so it's it's always it's always nice to sort of give give people a a taste for the social skills and the and and all that to let them build a picture of me without the autism and then introduce it because it's 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 more like profound in that way to other people yeah it's it's obviously it it's something that just immediately crushes your view uh not crushes that's very aggressive but immediately um makes people think and and i found that sort of doing it in that way people are very interested because it's like they've already built that connection with you without that sort of um group separating aspect and then once you've built that connection and you tell them about it, then they're, they're very sort of interested in seeing what life's like for an autistic person, which is always nice because it's not something that I had a lot when I was younger. Like it's nice for people to ask what life is like for me rather than, you know, be just assuming what life is like for me, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So, um, we're here today to talk about autism gender stereotypes. What does what does stereotype mean? Like, what what are gender stereotypes, and what are the most common stereotypes around autism that you've picked up on? I mean, for me, I I sort of feel like it ties into I had this word like neurosexism quite recently. And that's something that I do kind of identify with quite a lot in that um, there's this sort of idea of, I mean, I'm not a scientist by any means, but, you know, that sort of idea of, like, the male brain and the female brain, and that's something that I'm personally, I don't believe, like, I'm quite against it, just because I feel like it's quite destructive for a lot of people in particular often like women and non-binary people or people who don't fit and I was sort of I think that kind of comes into play with assumptions about autism is um this idea that for some reason we see it as like a male thing and I think that's I think a lot of it is because when people talk about it they often don't really think of like the historical context of it where women are kind of it's only like being quite recently that I suppose women and I mean obviously there are a lot of places in the world where women still don't have like the same rights as as men at all so they're not going to have that same access to education or you know diagnosis and stuff that um men I suppose especially white straight men might have I don't know I mean I do know but (laughs) yeah I think um, there there is because I know that there are, there have been some some papers where autism has been referred to as like the extreme male brain, which I think is absolutely absurd. Like, yeah, it's so. I mean, from because I I I'm 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 one of those those people that I, I'm willing to talk about about anything with with anybody. And I, I, I obviously have quite a lot of a sort of like scientific background and stuff, and it's it's I feel like it's it's always nice to chat about things that that are 
in in the world, but they're not they're not specifically sci- scientific in 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 a way, and it's not really something that you can um, that we've researched extensively. So I think it's it's nice to to chat about things like this because I, I I did like a literature review for my documentary, and from like the research that I've done around autism, like. Um, in terms in terms of the sci- scientific angle, there seems to be um, some neurological, hormonal, yeah, you know, type type differences in in autistic people. I think things to do with like the the bonding hormone oxytocin seems to be the receptors in the the body for for that sort of hormone is. Um, lacking i guess to a, to a certain extent it's not very it's not a very researched area and yeah. a lot of the research i found is to do with the problems i guess you know like the tre- treating of um air quotation mark symptoms and and all of that kind of stuff um and then i and then i suppose when when we're thinking about like the male and, and female brain there are i think one of one of the the difficulties with um science and and research and all of that is that it can it can appear quite certain yeah quite black and white i think yeah i yeah i definitely agree and i i i do think that there are some again talking about sort of generalities there are differences in the the structure like we've we've shown that there are differences in the structure of the male and typical male and female brain um in terms of you know like hormones and uh, yeah, neurosecretary you know hormones yeah i can see how that came into play and like fem- you know like females tend to be a bit more intelligent than men and but don't particularly show a lot of variation in in the level of intelligence so it's like there's more there's more men who are stupid sort of more the at the extremes of of the male brain there seems to be a lot of variation whereas females in in on average tend to be a lot more intelligent and i guess more emotionally in tune as well females tend to have a lot more in general of course um a lot more white matter which is associated with like connectivity of different brain regions um associated more with ability to sort of cross over between topics of thought um and then i guess guys have more of that large amount of gray matter rather than white matter which is sort of associated with cognition in specific areas so like there's not much crossover between sort of thought patterns and stuff I do, I do think that there are some stereotypes, and I, I think although there are differences in in the structure of um, brains, the way that that's expressed and the way that the the person is doesn't always line up with that train of thought. If that makes sense. Yeah, and especially as you know, we're living in a world where you know people are starting to sort of realize, like, kind of how fluid gender is and particularly within the autistic community um i think and i'd like to do more research into why that may be and i think my issue kind of is really that when people say things kind of make sort of blanket statements like women are better at masking their autistic traits or whatever but they don't really explain why that because I feel or I certainly felt this growing up that because you know and being I guess sort of yeah like as a young child being kind of picked on at school and a lot of that was kind of sort of related to gender I felt like it was very yeah I definitely I definitely think there is that there is more harassment for for women especially in the school environment it's it's horrendous like some you know, like those typical groups of boys at, at high school. Yeah, they can they can be absolutely terrorizing for for anybody. But 
you know, like yeah. them sort of off offhanded um, sexual comments that you're supposed to just, I guess, like, deal, deal with. with. Yeah. yeah, which I I think is a is a very it's it's not really acceptable in my in my eyes, and I never no, I've, I've always had that that opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just this idea that if you don't kind of fit these sort of and no one really does I mean no one really does for even the people who are kind of like bully somebody for that it's probably because they're insecure about their masculinity or femininity or whatever um yeah it's just a sort of idea that if you don't fit this very sort of rigid construct of what your gender is supposed to be that that makes you less or that makes you because I think we're not sort of used to when I think I do often feel that men are sort of allowed to kind of use their brains and use their intellect in a way that we're starting to see women be able to do more now. But it's I suppose that kind of comes into media representations. It's often portrayed in this like very sort of straightforward way rather than being a woman being sort of like, yeah, like a kind of Sherlock type in a way. Yeah. That's kind of the best way I can describe it, where I don't really like the word eccentric, but I suppose eccentric <laughs> is the best. You know, you don't, I feel as though we don't see that portrayed enough, like a woman that's kind of a bit odd yeah. um, in the nicest way possible, you know. I like, I like odd, odd, weird and strange. I would definitely consider them myself. Yeah, or like <laughs> a woman that doesn't... <laughs> women that doesn't like sort of get social keys and stuff and where I sort of feel as though women are from a very young age kind of raised to be accommodating and I think I think that the tendency of some some particular guys like you know those sort of high high narcissism kind of men who you know, the, their life revolves around relationships with attractive women, or you know that those kind of ones that are like like money and cars and and all that. I think those particular men can be quite harmful. Like they can they can do a lot of damage to people. Yeah, and I mean, women can be awful as you know. I guess all people can be awful at sort of kind of representing that sort of unhelpful messages really I mean we're all guilty of it I guess it's often like you know I suppose those sort of quite narcissistic people are probably so insecure about their own self-image that that's you know they feel like that's the most important thing and you kind of just want to like shake them (laughs) and be like it's okay like you don't have to you don't have to kind of Prove yourself all the time. Mm-hmm. It's quite, but yeah, I think we're all we all sort of play into it without realizing it. It's hard. Yeah, I, I, as you said, I think there there are some. Particularly me growing up in in high school, I I was harassed by sort of you know like the popular girls at school, like the mm. most most of my friends, my good friends, are female. So it's I, I hear heard a lot about sort of the way that the t- the toxic side to sort of girls at school in terms of not not all girls just those particular narcissistic ones that are assholes. <laughs> I think like groups of women often get like pitted against each other. I think that's the problem. Uh, yeah, it's. I read um I read something recently about like the difference between male and female bullying it's like male bullying tends to be more on the aggressive physical side whereas in the sort of female bullying is more about like defaming and sort of isolating people off from groups and spreading rumors and stuff like that do you you feel like that's something that you have experienced at school i mean i think like it's difficult because I um I think to be honest I can feel like men can be just as sort of manipulative as women. Yeah. And I yeah. think 
Yeah, I think all, I mean, I went to a girls' school for, a Catholic girls' school for a bit, and that was very, a lot of people came away from that, like, kind of, with sort of severe emotional issues, and um, I think maybe it does come from this constant, like, pressure that we have to be more beautiful or to be more whatever than the woman next to you rather than just like being alongside them yeah that's sort of my theory really because I think people are too quick to sort of be like oh men just punch each other and get on with it but it's like we shouldn't we shouldn't be accepting that either I know maybe that's easy to say but no I agree with you I agree with you and men are sort of encouraged to do that as well I think like why is it normal say for a man to like go on a night out and pick a fight with someone like that shouldn't be excused or normalized um but I don't I mean I haven't you know I'm not really one to talk about that but it's just sort of what I've heard from my yeah like my male friends and my brother and yeah cousins and stuff um and my dad not that they do that but <laughs> like <laughs> I definitely have seen a lot of that especially on nights out in Manchester, like, <laughs> yeah, it does, it does seem to be a trend. I've never seen two girls fight in a club. I've seen a lot of guys throw punches and stuff, but yeah, I think it's, it's, I think it's trying to prove yourself. Yeah, I think it's that whole sort of our, our an- ancestry with like dominance and all of that. I think there's, a, there's a lot of aspects of, men trying to sort of climb their social ladder if I suppose and, and a lot of them go a little bit more primal and start you know typically take the more physical and aggressive side to to, to doing that yeah. I guess I guess yeah. that's a, well I mean it is a problem I, I, I think that it's it's violence in any sort of form is ridiculous and unnecessary <laughs> mm. yeah for sure um oh there was, there was something that i wanted to oh, what was i gonna say um <laughs> so most common around us. Do, 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 do. i've lost it <laughs> <laughs> it's okay i'll come back i do i do think that there are you know, we do have a tendency with signs to i think some people who can be be a little bit more rigid in their approach to people um you know the the whole thing with science is that it it is done in a in a lens of generality like it's a general sort of statement and i think it it can come across as quite harsh and um narrow-minded when people just uh rattle on about um what what the science or statistics show or anything like that i think there should there should always be an aspect of talking to people and 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 sort of getting other people's views because not everybody lies on that generality especially autistic people i suppose and i think the people who tend to say that often tend to be the ones that benefit from it and it's like well, that might be easy for you to say, but you're not suffering. I mean, I mean, I'm probably, you know, guilty of that as well. It's like, like, it's like you're not, if you're in a sort of privileged group, you're not suffering with the consequences of making those kind of statements. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, <laughs> so it'd be like know. if I made it, you know, like, I guess that's like a, straight white person for instance if i made a comment about lgbtq plus people that was sort of very generalized but i yeah really i haven't got a clue and i'm not going to suffer the consequences of those r- remarks because i'm don't i'm not in that minority group yeah or about you know somebody of a different race or that might be i don't know something that a theory that someone has that I think I think that there is that there is a problem with the way that we communicate in 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 our society as it is. It seems to be all you seem to see on news is um, 
statements and and mm. contrary opinions, but you never sort of see that that those conversations that are that sort of an, analyze it and and bring in those post uh, those personal and emotional angles to things. And I think that's one of the re- one of the ways that we are sort of failing in a little bit in in terms of moving forward in social change like people yeah. want to hear that they want to hear their side to things uh, but they yeah but they, they never really see the contrast in those opinions and whenever those contrasts occur it seems to be quite inflammatory due to the nature of you know media glorifying mm. drama status quo works for you or if you you think it works for you you're going to defend it you're going to be like oh well that's just the way things are well it's a, it doesn't work which it doesn't work for most people i think you're gonna be like well that might be okay for you to say that but for me it's that's not good enough so um, I suppose that's a good. This is a good sort of segue into the the next question, which is, you know, what what are the problems of stereotyping, and what why are they a problem? In terms of autism, I guess. Yeah, just sort of the idea that I don't know. For me, the main thing I've been seeing is that kind of the only there have been more kind of representations of autism like in tv and stuff and that's amazing but sort of all male question sorry it's all male (laughs) yeah so like male straight and white and um nothing wrong with you know nothing wrong with that but like it's always that kind of storyline which is like oh it's a guy you know trying to get a girlfriend and that is very relatable and something that we can all kind of identify with i think it's like feeling inadequate or feeling weird or whatever but yeah it's kind of sort of sad and a shame considering the fact that I have spoken to you and work with so many autistic people of different like gender sexualities and like ethnicities and to not see that represented in 2020 is quite sad really that you know you only I think a sort of stereotype I guess example of a stereotype that I find quite challenging is um the big bang theory uh sheldon cooper um yeah because it's just like this complete sort of you know and stereotype of what people imagine autism and i i used to watch the show quite a lot i haven't watched it in a while so i don't really know the nuances of it, to be of it so i don't know if it's kind of improved since then but um it just seems sad that it does sort of feel like his autistic tendencies are played for laughs. Yeah. And it's I'm kind bit... of like suggesting that that makes him an asshole, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that makes him yeah. sexist and that makes him... And it's like, yeah, you do get autistic people who are assholes. Like, you get... Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like suggesting that those traits make him an arsehole because he's like that sort of stereotype of a genius who again yeah. is always a man <laughs> like um but I, I, we actually uh, i had a podcast with one of the the girls in the documentary as es, esme and she oh, um, was that the girl short hair and glasses yeah yeah oh yeah she was cool i liked her and um she uh we we were talking about the Big Bang Theory in that podcast actually, and it, she told me that the actual the guy who plays Sheldon Cooper is quite was was very keen to to give a good representation of um, Asperger's because he he did a lot of sort of reading around it, and he um, talked to um, I think a particular um, person with with Asperger's, and he sort of obviously developed a relationship with them and and sort of understood. A little bit more about what autism was about, and the the writers of the show obviously are, are searching for those relatable laughs, as as you said about um, traits and and stuff, and, and basically sort of amplifying the 
the, the what what people think autism is like i guess but i guess t- to be honest like it does do it does do a good a good job in in some respects with some of the the more typical traits but you know i, I think again he he is not like most autistic people like no, Sheldon I mean, Cooper. That's just my, yeah that's just my opinion no, I, I, I agree. Sort of, like, yeah, it gets a bit sort of boring after a while when you're just like... Oh, why are they laughing? Something. Why are we laughing at, at him? He's just saying something. And... Yeah. <laughs> so, like, yeah, like long science word, you know. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I just like to sort of see more... I mean, one that I, again, one that I quite like who is in some ways very stereotypical but also sort of fleshed out is um Arbed from Community. I haven't seen Community. Yeah, it is really like I because they kind of he is sort of stereotypical initially, but they he is also like quite a sort of well developed character and because he kind of tries to understand the world by imagining that he's in a TV show, which is very meta because he is, it is a TV show. <laughs> and um, they do, yeah, some of it is very sort of like touching. Um, and I do quite like the fact that he's not white. I know that's like only a small thing, but it is sort of just seeing, yeah, people of different, of various backgrounds that are, on the spectrum, so it's, it is. It isn't something that's confined to being male and and being white. Like mm. most, most a lot of the people in the autistic community that uh, on like Instagram and stuff, it just it just seem seem that the the majority of like the 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 Instagram sort of advocates and stuff seem seem to be female, which is obviously is obviously great and. We've got a lot of people who are from different backgrounds and a lot of people from different opinions and places in the world. You know, some one person in sort of Inuit, Inuit section of Canada. Oh, really? That's yeah. It's yeah. got Asp- Asper girl. She's, she's great. She does like comedy sketches and stuff. I, I think that we do, we do need a lot more realistic content on Asperger's and we and we also need to include people who are autistic as the actors like what it's yeah. like it's it's so much easier just to have an autistic actor acting yeah. autistic ra- rather than trying to get someone who has to read over stuff and and may not always grasp the point of it or the the ne- the nuances and and all that I had to look for um was it Ahmed? Abed? Abed. Abed. Nadir, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's played by a non-autistic actor, to be fair. But, um, do you think he did a good job then? I, I do feel like he, yeah, it's like his mannerisms are very like stereotypical, but he, um, yeah, I think just in the way that they sort of, res- the other characters respect him, it's good. He's not just like played for laughs. But I also look at looking on this uh, this article. Um, apparently, there is a new Muppet called Julia, who's an who's an autistic Muppet <laughs> on Sesame Street. Oh yeah, on Sesame Street. Yeah, <laughs> that was awesome. I saw that. Yeah, that's that's really cool. So like, kids can learn about. I it. think that's a, that's an important way of normalizing autism, like from a young age. Girls yeah, well. yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, I think also we we don't really see like on our you know like stories from the spectrum. We're trying to get more people with more complex needs. I think. Mm-hmm. Um. So I guess maybe yeah, that's something that needs maybe to be represented more in a way that's realistic, like, tasteful. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Not um, Rain Man. <laughs> no. <laughs> but 
but I understand that sort of at its of it, Rain Man, like at the time, would have been incredibly progressive and forward thinking. Yeah, I I enjoy it. Not gonna lie, like yeah, I thought it was a really good film. Mm, yeah, that's a good. I film. feel like he did play play the role quite well. I think just the mm. the story around it was just a little bit unreal. Well, it is incredibly unrealistic to to an extent. Like not many people, not many autistic people have anywhere near the the skills that he has <laughs> in that show. I know it's sort of this idea. Well, it's this idea that if you're going to be different, you have to be like useful. If that makes sense. Yeah, like, yeah. I never thought makes me about a bit that. Uncomfortable. That's like. And the... Yeah, like oh, you have to like contribute in some way, and then we'll forgive your like. Quirks. You have to be special and and outstanding. Mm. So w- when we talk about yeah stereotypes and stuff, and now we we've chatted a little little bit about it, but where where do we draw the line between sort of inaccurate or m- maybe unrealistic stereotyping and sort of t- talking about things in in terms of generality, like? How would how would you make draw that line? Where would you draw it? I guess I guess the only way sort of to to sort of do that in a way that's kind of gives people dignity is by doing your re- talking to people and finding out their experiences because I think you can know you can research something you can like talk you can know sort of what that's like but you're never gonna really be able to feel what it's like unless you've walked in those person's shoes so I guess it's maybe just about yeah making sure that if you are like a I don't know a scientist or I don't know how they do it like writing something about autistic people that you actually involve autistic people or if you're writing about autistic women or like autistic people of ethnic minorities you like involved those people in it if you're not of that group yourself Mm -hmm. i don't i don't know if that answers the question no that's like in terms of like media and and things in the public eye yeah i think i agree with you yeah you've you've got to have you've always got to have that aspect of personal emotional side to things when when you're talking about anything to do with science for a sort of mainstream audience it needs it needs to always have those aspects within it because if they're not included then it sort of propagates those quite ironic black and white views of autism <laughs> yeah yeah i know it's slightly ironic isn't it because yeah you know it's often like autistic people are sort of accused of seeing things in black and white and yet often Autism will be described by non-autistic people in these very black and white terms. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know, I guess saying things like, because I always found the, for ages I thought, you know, somebody gave me a compliment on like my social skills or whatever. I'd be like, no, I'm not. Like, I'm not good at that. Just because I read things about autism that kind of suggested like they have impaired social skills. And I think... So now I sort of try to say, like, what is so people might not socialise in a way that is considered sort of, like, traditional. Yeah, it's different, isn't it? Like, they might... Yeah, it's just, like, different. And I think that needs to be explained more clearly, because otherwise you get people like me looking it up and thinking that you're just this sort of kind of very... Damaged human. Unappealing person. Yeah, or, like, someone that people just don't... I think one of we kind of go on the media kind of goes on about like charm and charisma too much without actually talking about like being a good person like more so much emphasis is that's gone slightly off topic is put on like being likable mm-hmm. it's quite unquite likable and they're not enough is put into actually being like kind yeah and actually it shouldn't matter much how you how you communicate with people as long as you're not really upsetting anyone or yeah um but i I think i think like one of the one of the way the things that i was trying to get from 
um, this question is that like I I feel like in in de- in this day and age, people do see they 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 see life as snippets. Like they don't they they'll watch maybe a three second three minute video on online about um, which highlights some of the more some some of the parts of you know things like for example with a podcast you know someone might chop chop up the podcast and um isolate bits of in, information or something that someone said and then produce a, a blog or something about it but not not many people will yeah. listen to it in full and get an idea of the context like i think that can sometimes yeah. come across as this person's an asshole for thinking this or, or talking about this rather than getting a full idea of, of what they're about, I guess. Yeah, we're a bit like, I can't believe they said that. <laughs> Graceful. This when person. It's actually, it's just a way of people. <laughs> this, per- this person said that all females are not autistic, they're just a bit strange. That's, no. <laughs> yeah. This person hates yeah. women or whatever. Yeah, like... Yeah, I see that. We all do that all the time with celebrities. We're like, I can't believe they tweeted that or they mm-hmm. made that comment. And really, it's... I mean, I do that as well. I'm guilty of being like, I can't believe they said that. But it's a bit unfair, really, because they're not really there to explain. They can't... I mean, I guess everyone's got to be allowed to express their opinion unless it kind of really hurts other people. Yeah. Um, or unless it, like, falls into, like, hate speech. Um, but, yeah, we do, we do definitely, like, jump to conclusions. And I guess the same goes for maybe me listening to someone saying something about autism that I just find, you know, like, maybe a bit superficial, and I'll immediately jump to a conclusion that that person is, like, doesn't care, which... You know, so we're all guilty of doing it. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I definitely, if, if I see something said about autism, especially Twitter, like Twitter is the worst for it. Like if I see someone saying something that I don't agree with, I, I have sort of an immediate sort of reaction that I want to tweet about it and and all that. But then I guess I've sort of put a, a mental block on myself, sort of give myself room to process it and and figure out like do i do i really want to give this person more attention by tweeting about it or yeah that's true in terms of like uh um that question in the context of a sort of casual discussion like someone that you meet at a party or a friend of a friend or a a relative or or something like that like how how would you go about ch- talking about these type of things and and expressing opinions without sort of inaccurately stereotyping or or anything like that? Um, I just I don't know. I tend to in my kind of conversation style in general, I I am um, I do have a tendency to sort of like self censor and kind of edit myself a bit too much while I'm talking. Mm-hmm. So I guess I kind of tend to do that a bit and or I kind of talk about things from my experience and my experience is very sort of relatively, it's very sheltered, I suppose, compared to what a lot of autistic people have gone through. So I guess I kind of try to say that and I sort of hope that therefore then they don't think that I'm just talking in stereotypes or suggesting that. Hmm all autistic people are like me because they're not I think when you're expressing an opinion that maybe won't be fully agreed with you always as long as you're considerate of the other person's opinion and you don't sort of shove it in the other person's face which obviously would lead to confrontation I think being being that way and being always very considerate of the environment that you're in you know, and just just having a normal conversation with someone, um, it's it's always good to try and hear people out and always f- fall back on that you know idea of just having a discussion rather than t- 
taking shots at each other, I suppose. Yeah, and I think there's too much, like, lots of, like, rhetoric in our, in our culture is kind of, people feel like they always have to win arguments. Yeah. And I, like, I don't want to, especially, you know, it's somebody else's life. So for them, it's not just, like, this fun debate that, you know, they're trying to win. It's their experience and their life. Mm-hmm. So I think I try not to go into, you know, I think it's good just to go into, like, have a discussion and learn something rather than, like, trying to win yeah. an argument. Yeah. I, f- I feel that a lot. Um, Definitely. Hmm. You know, like, I'm, yeah, you're not going to start lecturing somebody on something that you don't actually know a lot about or you don't know as much about. You haven't experienced yourself. Especially when it's so personal um, to somebody. Like even if even if you do mm. feel like they're completely wrong, you should always if whenever you're talking about someone's experiences or someone's life, you should always you should always err on the the side of niceness. Respect r- respect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you shouldn't like say well you're wrong because then they could be like, Well actually that like happened to me, you know, so um, and that could ruin yeah, someone's this, day this, or week. <laughs> yeah. I think this idea that, yeah, we, people are sort of, and that definitely comes from like social media as well, like the comment section of people like trying to win an argument is, is very, it's very unhelpful. Because not everything has to be competitive. It's like we're all trying to work towards the common goal of, um, Connecting, connecting people and getting a, a good idea of people's opinions and, and weighing them up and, and all of that. I mean, I think in, in terms of personal experiences of talking about autism, it either goes, the, the bad experiences that you would sort of see would, would either go one of two ways. One is the, the person thinking they know about autism and then when I say that I'm an autist I'm an autistic person saying oh you shouldn't you shouldn't identify with your disability and all that so they they try and take that nice angle on things but it, it because they're not listening to what I'm saying it it actually just comes off as yeah. very annoying and um narrow minded and then you've got the other side yeah, I've had as people... well people you know just especially the older generation just saying, ah, oh, well, no, oh, that's just part of normal life, you know, especially with, like, mental health, yeah. like, oh, everyone gets a bit down. Everyone has that. <laughs> yeah. That's very frustrating, isn't it? Yeah. But I always take the angle of humour. You've got to laugh about it, I think. I find it hard when people are like, a lot of people are like, oh, you should see it as a gift, and they're being nice, they're being genuine. Mm-hmm. That's when I guess I, I want to explain more about it. But yeah, when people are like, oh, everyone feels like that, you sort of feel a bit like, oh my gosh, am I just making like a massive deal of nothing? Because <laughs> I remember having that reaction from a friend in school and it was just like this anger because she was like, I suppose she saw my life as kind of perfect because, you know, in a lot of ways I am really really fortunate but I was kind of being like I'm not saying that I'm not fortunate but this is something that maybe is something that I struggle with that you might not struggle with Mm -hmm. and she yeah she just got so like very very angry um because she was like everyone has that like yeah and that's quite hard to deal with because then you think, am I just being a drama queen? It's trying to be nice, isn't it? But it's coming from that narrow-minded angle of I know kind of this is why what I'm saying is right, which is Mm. always going to be a a difficulty when you're talking to someone who literally lives as an autistic person. (laughs) Mm. Or they, I suppose, yeah, it's like, because I don't have the struggles of, I recognise I don't have the struggles of somebody with more complex needs. And so I suppose somebody's, when it's a sort of invisible condition, yeah, people just find it so hard to think outside the box and think, 
Well, what are you complaining about? Yeah, that's that's quite a, a common thing I would say. But always, always through through just I always try to talk to anybody who has that sort of narrow minded stance on things, and I, I have had a lot of luck in my own in my own life with with sort of bringing bringing people around and um, explaining more, and I guess. I always see those opportunities as a chance to make people more aware, I guess. It's never an uncomfortable, horrible experience for me, but I guess that's probably due to my outlook on things. But Yeah, and I yeah. But what do you, what do you think in t- in terms of like the the mainstream media and and film and TV and stuff? What changes do you think would I know you've you've mentioned of a few throughout, but what main changes do you think would help dispel these stereotypes? I think for a start, just seeing kind of mainstream representations of not only autistic women and girls, but yeah, sort of anyone who's kind of not the norm. Like a straight white man, I feel like I'm sounding like I'm hating straight white men. I'm not, but it, it would just be sort of nice to see a variety of autistic people because you do. I have seen characters on TV that you know, female char- you know, that have not got an autism diagnosis, but they're not the protagonist. Uh, have a lot of those sort. Of... Yeah, but it'd be nice, you know, just because in my own life, I I'd like to see the autistic people I know reflected yeah so I think that that would be a good start um sorry I've forgotten the rest of the (laughs) question okay no that's that's great like I think those are those are all things that would help combat these stereotypes and I think it is just down to exposure and I know it's sometimes it's, Mm. it's hard when when you know that there's a problem um to view it in a very sort of slow progressive way but i guess this yeah. this whole acceptance and um of of autism and even even with things like race and and sexuality and stuff um it is always a slow gradual process i guess and the more yeah. that we can talk about it and the more that we can expose people to it the more that we'll start seeing some positive changes in in the more concrete realm of policies and 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 education and and stuff like that. But it's a growing process, yeah. And we are we are both contributing to it with this uh, this little podcast. I hope, yeah. At least, yeah, I like to think so. So, what are the main three things that you want people to take away from this podcast? Like if you were to, oh, if you were to have a little summary on on Google, you know, like next to the the title, what would it say? Um. Oh, I guess yeah. Just that. I mean, it's quite an obvious, but I guess that autism can, you know, autistic people can. Autism isn't sort of exclusive to one. People of a certain background, like or gender, or you know, you can get. You get autistic people all over the world. They just people might just not know that they're autistic yet, and um, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't exclude. I guess is what I want to say. That mm-hmm. um, so I guess that's one kind of. Um, another one would be, um, yeah, I just want people to be more open to talking about it um and open to listening to people on the spectrum talk about and not sort of because i do sort of feel that people with yeah things like people who have a diagnosis of autism and people also people with mental health issues can get quite easily sort of to use a buzzword i guess gaslighted Mm -hmm. so i suppose because people kind of you know you can easily say Ah uh, well, you don't know what you're talking about because you have this condition, so that skews your view on things. But yeah, I think I guess yeah, the second thing would be to just encourage people to be to take an interest. Um, 
and the third thing. <laughs> I, I told sorry. you. I told you, didn't I? <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I think the third thing I don't panic. I'd like, I'd like people to take away is kind of the yeah, not seeing autism as this one way of thinking. I guess I haven't really spoken about that enough, but not seeing seeing autism as not just sort of like, yeah, this black and white way of thinking, but as, oh, I don't know, yeah, thinking. like creativity, different way of thinking, yeah, I suppose. Oh, actually, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, I guess maybe, I think I'll change that to uh, being aware of, I want people to be more aware of, like, co-occurring co mental health conditions. And well, we can include all both of those. I think they're both yeah. good things. <laughs> um, cool. Thank you very much for those. I know that can be the most difficult part of the podcast. You start <laughs> getting to that little flow of, of of chatting about stuff, and then um, you you're very in the present when you when you're chatting, especially when you're just in mm. front of a computer, just looking into space. Like you get quite into the present. You it's hard. To, to sort of bring yourself yeah. out of it and think about what you're talking about. and <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, no, wait, that, but also that, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> I get that. And then we got the last question, which is one that I ask every person who is autistic um, who comes onto the podcast. What does autism mean to you? <laughs> I suppose for me, it's, I mean, it, it, it's very hard to know because I haven't, experience life as a non-autistic person so um yeah for me I guess it it just means I guess a sort of different way of looking at things in in all its kind of positives and negatives um like I say I don't I don't necessarily see it as a gift I don't necessarily see it as a negative thing it just sort of is it's an element of me I do find it difficult to separate it from my personality, um, but I guess yeah, it's just another another part of who I am. I guess I sort of have quite a neutral attitude to it. I don't see it as a gift. Like I said, I don't see it as a gift. I don't see it as a, a curse. I used to see it as a curse, really. um, but I've I've kind of come to terms with it. Awesome. I do, I do agree with that. I'm, I'm very much on the, the neutral side of life in, in terms of mm, my view of autism. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is sometimes difficult, and it does make things hard. But it also gives you a little bit of a, a difference, which is always welcome, in all areas of life. I think someone with a drastic difference or at least a, a notable difference in how they work and, and process and think. I think all of that is very helpful in all aspects of society. But thank you very much for that, Hermione. Do you want to give everybody some links to things that you want them to um, see? I know that you've, you've got the recipe for being a woman, um, your poetry book, which we talked a little bit about. We've got the Blue Bottle Mystery, uh, the one that you read when you were younger to sort of understand yourself a little bit better. And then what was the other one? I can't remember. Ab, ab, ad something. Abded. Abed. Abed, oh, Community, mm -hmm. the show, uh, TV show Community, which is on Netflix, if people have Netflix. Um... It's also on Amazon Prime, I think. Very cool. Are there any links that you um, want to give to your uh, like blog site and all that? Yeah, so my blog is, um, the address is hermionecameron1.wordpress.com. Okay. Hermione is H-E-R-M-I-O-N-E. -E, and then it's all lowercase, Cameron is C-A-M-E-R-O-N. Okay. Um, and my, yeah, I put a lot of, 
Yeah, on Instagram, I'm my yeah my handle is Hermione one, which is um H E R M I R O N Y one. It's meant to be like Hermione. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> um, and my Twitter. Thank you. <laughs> my Twitter's the same as well, and I tend to post stuff I'm doing there. Want to. And then you also have your stories on the spectrum section. Yeah, stories from the spectrum. I definitely recommend it's um so it's on the National Autistic Society website, and um which is www.autism.org.uk uh, slash about slash stories, and then there's also the Spectrum magazine on the website, which is um under on the nas website under about adult life resources spectrum very cool thank you for very much for those um i will put all of those in the description and if there's anything else that you want me to put links to um i will also include them but thank you thank you very much for coming on to the podcast today to talk about um, something I've always I've always wanted to have a little um, chat about um, these types of things, and it's it's nice to finally um, have someone on with you know who's will, willing to have a nice nice and uh, productive discussion about something that that may be some, sometimes a little bit inflammatory, but it's, I think we've yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think we've done well. <laughs> Great. Have you enjoyed it? I've re- yeah, I've really enjoyed it, actually. It's my first time doing something like this on a podcast. So, yeah, I was a little bit nervous, but actually, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. It's just been like having a chat. Cool. So thank you, everybody, for listening and tuning into the 40 Audio podcast. You can always find the podcast on Anchor, Spotify and Apple Podcasts under the 40 Oti Podcasts, of course. And then there are my YouTube channel. There is my YouTube channel, rather. Asperger's Growth, which I post videos about autism and mental health. And my documentary website that's recently aired. It's called Asperger's in Society. If you want to go um, have a watch, it's completely unmonetized and free to watch. And if you want to learn a little bit more about uh, the process of making it and maybe um, see some more of like behind the scenes footage and interviews with people who um, were on the documentary, you can find that at www.aspergesinsociety.com. Other than that, social medias on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Aspergis Growth. Very easy to find me. And if you do want to donate, um, on Patreon, which is always very welcome because this this podcast is always ad free and always unmonetized, so any, any support in that sense would be amazing. Thank you very much for watching, everybody, listening rather, or watching if you're on YouTube. Can never do these these outros very well. I don't like to end up like summarize conversation. It's it's very difficult to uh, to do that. But while I will leave you with is have a great day if you're in the midst of a day or have a great little sleep if you're uh have a nice relaxy time in the bath or uh or whatever it's a bit weird for me to think about that maybe do don't do that and i'll see you in the next episode of the 40 Oti podcast thank you very much see you later guys you can say bye as well Bye. Stay hydrated.